The title of my talk um, is uh, The Space Revolution. Um, how the revolution space flight can open the way to a future unlimited in space, time, knowledge, and resources. Um, that's a rather ambitious subject to deal with in a half hour talk. But I'll, I'll try to give you a sense of, of, of what I, I, I'm seeing. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my brief remarks on uh, Friday, um, you know, uh, 20 years ago we were having uh, books published with titles like The End of History, The End of Science, Everything worth doing has been done. Everything worth knowing is known. You know, it's been an interesting voyage. Sorry you missed it. Um, but here's the uh, summary. Um, but th th those viewpoints couldn't have been uh, more wrong. And uh, if we look at what has happened in the past 20 years, um, there, there has been um, a revolution, a revolution in knowledge and a revolution in possibilities. Um, you know, um, okay, and, uh, and the space program ha has been central to this, of the space effort, broadly speaking. Um, now, the space effort is divided into two parts. There is the unmanned uh, effort, planetary exploration, space astronomy in particular, uh, and then there's the human space flight effort. Um, now, in the first, uh, we have seen uh, results that have been absolutely epic. That is, commencing with the launch of and repair of the Hubble Space Telescope following 1990, uh, and then a series of remarkable discoveries in the late 90s, discovering a fifth force that is accelerating the expansion of the universe, um, and, and innumerable other finds, um, as well as producing what I consider the great art of our time. Okay. Um, and then the Kepler Space Telescope, uh, really a, a low-cost mission, but a, a remarkable one, uh, which has discovered over 2,000 extrasolar planets, confirmed, and thousands of more unconfirmed. Um, you know, he, he, before 1990, we had not discovered any extrasolar planets. And while we suspected that they existed, People have suspected that they existed since Giordano Bruno. Now, Giordano Bruno, in the late 1500s, said, okay, the stars are actually suns, not just points of light decorating the sky, and they have planets going around them, and there are people on those planets, and when they look up in the sky, they see our sun among the stars. We're going around it, and therefore, we are in heaven. For which he was burned at the stake. But the hypothesis is correct. Okay, the Earth is in space. Okay? It's not just astronauts that go into space. We are in space. Okay? We are part of space. But anyway, Kepler discovering thousands of new planets, and I a month ago, I heard a summary presentation on the Kepler results by the astronomer uh, Sarah Seeker, and her last chart was, on the basis of these findings, we now conclude that one in five stars has an Earth-like planet in its habitable zone. One in five Earth-like planet in its habitable zone. There are billions of other Earths in our galaxy. We are living in a universe filled with births. We are in heaven. Okay, you know, uh, a couple of years ago I read this book, Escape from Camp 14, and 
it's written by this man who, as a boy, was born and raised in a North Korean prison camp. And the idea of escape never occurred to him because he did not know that there was anything else outside the camp. That there was anything different, that this was the world. This is how it was. He didn't know about cities, you know, Pyongyang, let alone New York. He didn't know, he didn't know they existed. Eventually, he found out by a new prisoner who had lived in the outer world and they escaped and so forth. But yeah, there's a world outside the camp uh, filled with uh, millions of incredible things. Um, and we, so we discovered this world. And yes, and we've also, as I, I noted, made discoveries within our own solar system, um, in particular bearing on the, uh, our ability to develop the moon and Mars. We've discovered water on the moon. That's been confirmed. There is water in the uh, polar uh, craters. Um, and that could be very useful in supporting um, lunar exploration and development. Um, and there's a lot of water on Mars, okay? Underground lakes, glaciers as far south in the northern hemisphere as Athens is on Earth, 38 north. Um, terrific. Okay. So there are billions of worlds, and within our own solar system, the worlds are more attractive than Manned space flight program, on the other hand, okay, science programs have been purpose driven and they have produced great results for that reason. Okay. Manned space program has been vendor driven and so it has been entropic and it has not made progress. However, every problem provokes its own solution. Okay. And if the government human space flight programs have gone absent without leave. Uh, that has opened the door to other players. And we actually started seeing attempts at this in the 90s, but finally in the first decade of this century, someone attempted to create their own launch company and actually succeeded. Um, of course, that's Musk. And uh, what SpaceX has done is historic. Because what they have done is shown that it is possible for a lean, mean, well-led entrepreneurial organization to do things that previously was thought that only the governments of major powers could do. And not only that, do it in one-third the time, at one-tenth the cost that it can be come to be considered normal, and even do things that people had written off as just not happening, like reusable launchers that come and land back at the place where they took off from. Okay. So this has happened, and as a result, okay, here's the important thing, we must be making some very valuable technologies, the Falcon, the Falcon Heavy, the BFR, Dragons, but he's done something that has more significance than that. Okay. He's shown that these sorts of things can be done privately. And therefore, first of all, he's opened the door for a raft of other entrepreneurial ventures. You know, because you know, Musk is not the richest man in the world. According to Forbes, he's the 94th richest man in the world. There's a hundred. There's 93 people that are richer than him, and there's hundreds that are comparably rich. Okay, and there's only so many yachts and mansions you can buy. And um, so, what else is for sale? What wants for sale is immortality, which is the real goods. Okay, if you're someone who enables something like this, then you have your chance for immortality. Okay. Um, and to be not just a person of the moment, but a person of history. Um, so they're getting in the game. 
And as a result, literally dozens of space launch startups are getting funded. Literally dozens. Uh, one person I spoke to the other day said there were over 30. Um, and not just launch companies, but spacecraft companies and space instrument companies and, and this and that. And the effects have gone beyond the space world to other sectors where people have come to accept stagnation uh, as the norm. For instance, fusion power. There are fusion power startups getting funded right now and with real money. 70 million, 200 million, in one case, 500 million dollars for, for people with uh, innovative ideas on how to do fusion. They're getting funded by private money. Okay? And they're not operating on a schedule of turning on their machine in the year 2035, like uh, another project that you might have heard of. Um, the, um, you know, they, they're, they're talking about doing things in the 2020s. Private investors are not interested in projects with 50-year timelines. Not at all. And um, now this is very significant. It's significant for fusion and it's significant for space. Okay. I actually worked in the fusion program in the 1980s. And I remember I was at Los Alamos and, and our group leader took us all to lunch and he made a comment and he said, you know, when fusion power is finally developed, it's not going to be developed at a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be by a crackpot working in his garage. And, uh, well, I, I don't think it's going to be by a crackpot working in a garage, but I think it's going to be by a startup working in a warehouse. Yeah. Okay. Now, so here we go. There's going to be cheap space launch. Now, how can that be, even if you use the rockets? Okay. There's only about 100 satellite launches a year. If you took SpaceX's existing budget and you divided it by all of those launches, let them take the whole market, okay, you still, you know, are at about $1,000 a kilogram. But of course, if you cheapen it, there'll be more launches. But even if there's 200 launches, 300, you don't get to, uh, aircraft type prices. But what if you get into the aircraft type market? If you look at the design of the BFR, this idea of flying this whole spaceship all the way to Mars and refueling it and flying it back or the entire second stage with the passenger cabin and the whole thing. That, that, that does not make sense as a mission plan. The BFR does certainly make sense uh, as a mission plan, as a fully reusable 150 ton to a LEO launch vehicle, but not as a cruise ship for going to Mars and back. But where it really makes sense is intercontinental travel. And uh, the design actually fits that. And landing offshore and coming back and landing offshore and the um, and running on methane fuel, which is uh, the cheapest fuel there is. Um, you know, fuel costs don't matter much if you have an expendable launch vehicle. It's a, a significant part of the cost of the launch. If you have an airplane, it matters a lot. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they have now begun to say so, and, but I, when I wrote my critique of ITS, I point this out immediately, that this thing appeared to be designed optimally, not for trips to Mars. I mean, and not in particular, not for colonizing Mars. Colonizing Mars is a one-way trip, and the cheapest way to go to Mars if you're a colonist is to ride the freight. The, the, you know, they're sending this BFR with 100 colonists to Mars, and it's coming back empty. Why are you taking this thing back? Um, you know, but New York to Sydney in 53 minutes. Sydney to New York. You know, there's thousands of intercontinental flights every day. Now, it is true that um, at least the nature of the current design is not attractive for taking off from inland cities. You wouldn't take off from Paris. But you, but for coastal cities, yes. 
and there are plenty of coastal cities, and there are thousands of flights between the coastal cities on different continents every day. And if you look at this, okay, the current cost of intercontinental airplane flight is about $20 a kilogram. Yeah, because if you with your butt left, suitcase weigh 100 kilograms, and you're flying from uh, Los Angeles to Sydney, you might buy a ticket for $2,000, that's $20 a kilogram. Now, it took a long time for aviation to get this cheap. But, let's say $200 a kilogram, 10 times. $200 a kilogram, well, that's flying Los Angeles to Sydney first class, okay? But people do that. People do that. And, and the benefit of doing it this way would be not merely that you get a tablecloth and a free drink instead of having to pay $5 for the drink. Um, pay an extra thousand dollars, you get a free $5 drink. Um, you get to get there in 55 minutes instead of 15 hours and you get 40 minutes of zero gravity and looking out windows at the stars of space. I think there's a market there. Okay, the $200 kilogram leveled. Uh, and the, uh, now if you think about that, these are flights in uh, the, the high suborbital, just barely short of orbital, and in fact the vehicle that can do it can get to orbit. Well, what about people that really aren't interested in going to city but just want to enjoy six hours of your gravity? I mean, I certainly agree with uh, Claude Nicolier that for six month flight to Mars, you don't want to do zero gravity, but for six hours in space, zero gravity is a, a, a wonder. Um, so why not, instead of going to just a 50 minute trip, stay in orbit, three or four orbits, land, spend a day in space, okay? Now that's a more attractive form of space tourism than these people that want to do four minute suborbital flights up and down, okay? And especially if the price, instead of being $200,000, is $20,000. Okay, there you go. All right, well, okay, so that's like taking a, a day cruise around your, you know, the harbor around the island. Uh, people do that. Um, well, what if you want to spend a week in space? Well, it doesn't make sense to have a BFR uh, on orbit for a week when you could be using it every day to make money. Um, that's when your space hotel start to make sense. If you have vehicles that can do this kind of flight routinely, well, instead of leaving the thing in orbit for a week, you drop the passengers off in a space hotel for a week and somebody comes back. So there's the market that is going to make space flight cheap. And that means things like orbital research labs and even orbital industrial facilities. I was speaking uh, a month ago with uh, people from a company that want to make fiber optics on orbit. And it, you can make zero loss fiber optics and zero gravity. Um, they've done experiments on the space station that have proven it. The economics of doing it on the space station don't work out, and, and the bureaucracy they have to put up with on the space station makes it impossible to do anything serious. But they did do the experiment, they showed it worked. Well, a company like that could launch its own orbital research lab, or, or in this case, actually a manufacturing facility, and produce this product, which is uh, worth many, many times more than $200 a kilogram. And once again, okay, look, I have to say this because okay, Musk is a showman. Musk exaggerates. He even lies, okay? Uh, he's not Mother Teresa. Um, and, and, and there are unattractive parts of his personality. Um, but it has to be said that his accomplishments are quite real. Has to be said. And he has lowered the cost of space launch already from $10,000 a kilogram to $2,000 a kilogram. Fact number five. That's a real accomplishment. Okay. And yes, I think it can be done in another factor of 10. And now we're talking. Okay. 
So, at this kind of money, now let's say, now that's the orbit. Let's say to travel interplanetary is 10 times that. So now you're back up to $2,000 a kilogram. And you got your 100 kilograms, that's $200,000 to get to Mars. That is the kind of price that is the threshold for colonization. It is. It is the kind of money a middle class person can mobilize if they liquidate their prime assets, such as, for instance, their house. Um, it is, in fact, the price of transportation from England to North America in the 1700s in equivalent terms. That is, it, a middle class person could sell their house, their farm, and they could get to America. A working class person could commit seven years work to pay for his passage. Seven years times, say, $45,000 a year for a working stiff today is $300,000. It, it is the social equivalent cost. Okay? It is a cost that people can do. Now, You know, the Mars Society is having a contest for designing a thousand person Mars colony, and it includes uh, the 40 points for technical, 30 points for economic, 10 social, 10 political, 10 aesthetic. But the economic might be of the greatest interest here, because I think we can all kind of figure out that there are principal technical solutions to making the various things you need on Mars. The, the big question for colonization is how does it pay for itself? The government base can be paid for out of public largesse, but if it's actually ever to grow as a society, it must be able to pay for itself. It does not need to be fully autarkic. No society on Earth is fully autarkic. Okay? It does need to be able to uh, produce the things that are massive and heavy, food, plastic, steel, okay, things like that, sure. And, and there are ways to produce that. But can, can you expect a Mars colony to produce things like this? No. But then this doesn't weigh that much. Okay. And even if you have a system that is an automated greenhouse, who's producing the flow controllers? You know, the digital equipment that is controlling it. You're going to need to import some stuff from Earth. So you have to be on target. There are plenty of societies on Earth that make lots of money without exporting anything material, okay, like Manhattan. Okay. Doesn't export anything material to speak of. Okay. Maybe a few clothes from the garment center. It's insignificant compared to the, the monetary flows that go in and out of Manhattan. Um, Singapore, Japan, Etc. Um, well, no, Japan does, of course, export things that are material, but they have no, but not from any uh, what are called natural resources. But anyway, you get the idea. I think, I mean, I don't grow my own food, I don't make my own clothes, I don't produce these glasses. I produce ideas. That's how I get my money and I buy my food. Um, the, the, so, if Mars can produce ideas, it can buy, well, it won't need to buy food, but it can buy those flow meters that are necessary for an automated greenhouse to produce the food. Um, it can probably produce the glass and so forth. But once again, the very high-tech stuff. We need to buy some stuff. Okay. Who are Martian colonists going to be? They're going to be, uh, on the whole, a group of technologically adept people in a frontier environment where they're forced to innovate and where they're free to innovate. Um, and so they'll innovate. They're going to have limited acreage in their greenhouses. So they're going to want ultra-productive crops. That, and, you know, and so they're going to do genetic engineering of crops to make ultra-productive crops because every square meter of that greenhouse is going to be valuable. And yes, they're going to be interested in robotics because and artificial intelligence because there's going to be nothing shorter uh, on Mars than labor and both labor in quantity and labor in diversity, okay? That is, there's both a need for increased numbers of workers and increased numbers of skills. 
And what artificial intelligence allows you to do is a given individual can now perform a variety of things that otherwise would have required training in a variety of occupations because he has the advice of, of this thing. Okay? And, and so forth. So they're going to push this stuff. I think they're going to push fusion power. Okay? Um, because deuterium is five times as plentiful on Mars as it is on Earth. But you can make fossil fuels on Mars, but it takes energy to do it. Okay? Geothermal, okay, so geothermal power on Mars, but that's not really a first class power source. I mean, that's useful for a few places we can get it. Um, fusion. Now, all these sorts of inventions that they will make for their own purposes will be licensable on Earth. And I think, um, and, and well, patents can produce income and that can be used to buy those flow meters. So forth. And the, also the significance of private launch companies implies there can be private colonization efforts. I was asked the other day by a journalist saying, well, isn't this terrible? Now you can have Musk or people like us running off and establishing their own colonies on Mars with no government supervision. How do we know that they will obey the laws we have here? I said, that's the point. That they won't need to obey the laws we have here. They will be able to create their own system. And this means that Mars colonization, why do you want to go to Mars? Okay. Um, to have an opportunity to go to a place where you can be the maker of your own world rather than just the inhabitants of one that has already been made. <clears throat> and I think we will have diverse Mars colonies based on all sorts of ideas that people here consider pretty wild. Uh, you know, you will have Mars colonies based on libertarian ideas of free enterprise. You will have communist Mars colonies, okay, and everything in between. You will have colonies um, that are uh, hedonistic in attitude and, 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 and others that are puritanical, founded by people who want to get away from all this decadence and raise their children in a decent place. And others, founded by, by people that, that are followers of, of, of the religion and, and, and others who, who regard that as, 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 as suppressed. And, and you'll have people from uh, nations that have been overrun by occupiers wanting to have a place where they can be free. You'll have people who simply want to preserve their unique language which is disappearing within the cosmopolitan Earth and, and so forth. And, there will be all sorts of, of, of colonies established on Mars. And, and, and there will be people with very original ideas on, on political structure. And these will be what you know, the founders of the United States called a noble experiment. The, 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 you know, the ideas of 18th century liberalism that the United States was founded on were not invented in the United States, they've been invented in Europe, and there were many people in Europe who were well acquainted with these ideas, and in, in many cases they believed in them, but they were regarded by the bulk of the governing classes as being pleasantly insane. Um, you know, you're going to let the common people try themselves, you'll never get a conviction. You're going to let people have any religion they want, and the, the society will fall apart. You, you're going to let people print anything they want to print, freedom of press, and that's a formula for chaos. This will never work. Um, but we decided to do it, and it worked well enough that the society was quite successful, so much so that millions of people voted with their feet to come to America, and it became a huge country, a prosperous country, a very successful country, um, especially because it attracted all of this talent from everywhere else. Um, and the, the, so the Mars colonies that do find a better way, they will attract immigrants. And those that uh, ideas are fundamentally flawed will not. And, 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 and so some will succeed, some will fail. These will be experiments, not utopias. And some will succeed in certain respects and fail in others. But in other words, the ideas that work will be shown to work. And 
those companies will both prosper in themselves and they'll become examples for elsewhere, much as the, based on the proof rendered in the United States, the ideas of 18th century liberalism have now become normative across the globe, human rights, so forth. Um, and so this is how human society as a whole will progress. And then there's the asteroids. Now, people talk about the wealth of the asteroids, precious metals, this and that. I think that the wealth of the asteroids is that they provide millions of new places for space colonies. If Mars can develop based on exporting ideas, so can other places. Um, and I mean, uh, eventually there might be a governing authority on Mars. You need more new worlds. Um, and I actually don't believe that much in the uh, business plan of exporting platinum from asteroids because it turns out you have to refine the asteroids. In other words, the platinum is only, you know, one-tenth of one-tenth of a percent of the asteroid and you have to do tremendous refining in order to get it down. Okay, the steel is about 10%. Okay, you can make steel on asteroids, not to export to Earth, certainly, but to make space colonies with. Um, and maybe in the course of doing that, you are trying some platinum and you can export that to Earth as a byproduct of your activity. Um, but new worlds there, and new worlds beyond. As I said, I think there's real hope for fusion power now, precisely because of the success of SpaceX. Okay? We get fusion power, I'm willing to bet we get it from one of these startups, not from either. We can bet on that. Um, and uh, anyone want to take that? No? Okay. Um, vast supplies of helium-3 in the atmospheres of the outer planets. Jupiter's got too much gravity to mine it, but not Saturn or Uranus and Neptune. Um, and the so we'll go out there. And then, well, there's the Kuiper Belt, there's the Gulf Clouds, and there's the stars. And of course, over the next decade, we're going to be launching new space telescopes, study first, Webb, uh, the Habitable Planet Finder, Lavoir, uh, and others that haven't yet to be proposed. Um, and we'll have optical interferometers on the moon made possible by clocks developed here. Um, the very precise clocks do not go interferometer. Um, but it's going to be done right here in this town. Um, we'll discover other worlds. We'll map other worlds. Literally map them with telescopes in space. And the urge to go there will be irresistible. And I think we're now beginning to see the outlines of the technologies that can enable interstellar flight. Laser transmission of the energy, um, either to directly push sails or to uh, enable very high ISP electric propulsion, um, either using onboard propellant or perhaps mobilizing the space plasma itself. Um, so interstellar propulsion is possible. So, we're going to do it. All this things going to happen, and it's beginning now. This is the time that okay. some of these discoveries that I've made, they've been made very much in the lifetime of almost everyone in this room in the period since the 90s. Um, and the breakthrough into space has happened just this decade, and it's about to elaborate itself. I think five years from now, there will be a dozen SpaceX. It's not just startups that would like to be a SpaceX, but companies with uh, a, a degree of activity and uh, hardware comparable to what we see in SpaceX now. And they'll be competing, they'll be driving down prices, um, and the Moon and Mars are going to become very accessible. I mean, the space agencies do not have a competent plan to do Mars right now, but not, or even the moon for that matter. You know, creating a lunar orbiting tow booth is not a way to go to the moon. It's frankly, it's a scandal. Um, but very soon the tools are going to be in hand 
to enable a, a very cost-effective lunar program and Mars program, and then I think the political class will go for it. The thing that we have been trying to sell since 1998, when the Mars Society was founded, that humans to Mars is going to become a lot more sellable. Once the reusable cheap heavy lift is in hand, and it becomes a much more sellable proposition when you go to the president elect and you say, how about you and Mars? And he or she says, uh, well, maybe, how much will it cost if it had to be done by the end of my second term? And if you can answer, well, it won't cost that much and it can be done by the end of your second term, so I have the launch, we already have the capsule, we already have this one and that one. Well, then let's do it. it you know, it's what Musk is, has, is, is doing, what Bezos is currently doing with other people is they are lowering the threshold by developing substantial subsets of the hardware that's needed to make this doable. They're going to also make it sellable. Okay? And so it'll happen. And so we're still needed. We're going to have to make the sale. Okay? Musk is going to want to sell that product to send people to Mars. Okay? We're going to make sure somebody buys it. Um, not necessarily his, but you get an idea. Um, and also the other thing is you, you need to know where this stuff has come from. It's come from an idea. You know, Victor Hugo said, nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. And the reason why that is true is because the idea whose time has come can recruit to its banner the forces necessary to realize it. Now, of course, though, there has to be the messenger, messengers of the idea. Okay, because the idea itself is just an idea. Someone has to convey it. Someone has to spread it. Okay. The Mars Society does three things. We spread the vision. We support the political programs of, uh, that, that might uh, propose and stuff on Mars, and we do our own projects like the stations. The second two are most tangible, but I think the first is the most important. Because it's by spreading the idea that we recruit the forces necessary to implement the idea. I know this concretely, because we recruited Elon Musk. Absolutely. Okay, because I was there, I took part in it, I helped do it. Um, to the, the vision of human smart. That's why there is a SpaceX. So Musk is in this game because of this vision conveyed to him by us. And many of the people working for him, who are working for him 80 hour weeks to make this happen. Okay. They can make more money elsewhere. They're there at SpaceX because they want to make this happen. Okay. Um, the, the Bezos, he was actually recruited by uh, Gerard O'Neill, who that version of the vision, the space colonies. Um, others by others, perhaps. But we need to be agents of this idea. By serving as agents of this idea, we can be the ones that make it happen. Okay? You can't win a war without an army. Recruiters are necessary to create the army. Okay? And necessary to inspire the army with the vision of what it is needs to do. Um, so this is happening. Uh, we're seeing it right now. And, and if we're successful, in 500 years from now, there's going to be thousands of new branches of human civilization. Um, on Mars, in the asteroids, in the Kuiper Belt, and among the planets in nearby interstellar space. There will be. And there will be thousands of new cultures, new literatures, new histories of great deeds of people that have done amazing things to make those civilizations possible. When they look back at this time, what will they consider important? Will they consider it important whether the Democrats won the House, how Brexit worked out, which gang of thugs took power in Syria? Okay. None of this stuff. They won't even know about most of these people. 
Okay? Only, you know, history PhDs will have heard of Donald Trump. A lot of people will have heard of Elon Musk. Um, and maybe they'll have heard of us. But whether they've heard of us personally, they'll certainly have heard of this time. Because this time is going to be remembered. Because this is when we first set sail for the worlds. That's why it's going to be remembered. That's why it deserves to be remembered. And you can't guarantee that you're going to be remembered. But you can make sure that you deserve to be remembered. And that's what we need to do. Let's deserve to be remembered. Thank you.
by certainly, well, actually by the mid-1600s, uh, there was uh, a great deal of, of, of effective political independence in the colonies. I mean, you know, Massachusetts is named the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, I know what, they, if you understand the significance of that, but the Cromwellians in England had called their uh, former government the Commonwealth. Um, and, and they had overthrown the, the, the kingdom and replaced it with a commonwealth. Now, the Cromwellians were defeated and the monarchy was restored, I believe, in 1660 or so. Massachusetts continued as a commonwealth. Okay, so in fact, the, there was already a political divergence, a considerable one. Uh, between Massachusetts and Great Britain as early as 1660, which is uh, 40 years after the Pilgrims land. So, yes, while formal independence took a century and a half, um, informal independence had already formed within uh, 40 years. So, uh, it, I think there will be informal independence fairly rapidly within a few decades of the establishment of a colony, or maybe even immediately within the establishment of a colony. Uh, uh, formal independence, the formation of, uh, of nations, and so forth, uh, it could take more than a century. But, okay, that's the best answer I can give. Sir. Uh, just a short question. Uh, your, uh, regarding your reference to immortality, you were referencing to um, immortality by remembering, by, by doing this leap towards establishing something on Mars or outside of Earth, or was it something else? No, it was that. Okay. I mean, look, you know, I know Musk, and people sometimes ask me what motivates them. And, um, is he an egomaniac? Is he motivated by money? Um, no, to both of those. Um, he likes money, we all like money. He finds money useful and in fact necessary, but he's not in this for the money. I mean, if he was in this for the money, he would have done something else to start a rocket company. A lot easier ways to make money. He'll make money with SpaceX because he can make money doing anything, but it's not the money. And it's not ego per se. It's, um, what he's after is what the ancient Greeks called kleos, okay, which is eternal glory for doing great deeds. Okay. You know, that is the motivation of the heroes in Homer. They want eternal glory for doing great deeds. Okay, and they're willing to risk their lives to do that. Okay. And, or, you know, you take uh, Shakespeare, Henry V, the speech he gives at Agincourt, when somebody says, I wish we had more men here, he says, no, I don't want more men here. I want the glory for us. Um, and, um, and that's lust to a T, right there. He's Henry V. He's Shakespeare's Henry V. And, um, and it's a strength and it's a weakness. Uh, it gives him terrific drive. Uh, it also means he doesn't play well with others. Um, and there's some unattractive aspects. For example, you, you may have seen that he got angry when he wasn't the one that got to rescue the boys in Thailand. Um, and so there's an unattractive side to that. But nevertheless, that is the motivation of a classical hero. Immortality through doing great deeds. And, yeah. And, uh, it, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a product that can sell for a high price. Other questions? In the back, sir. Oh, I see. You. You. Uh, one question I never have heard asked or asked, what is a Mars colony actually going to do on Mars? You know, just generally, what's, what's the incentive of living on Mars? Well, I, I try to answer that. Um, the incentive of a Mars colony, okay, well, in general, is to have
have a place where you can go where you can make your own world. If you look at some of the most uh, daring and counterintuitive um, efforts at colonization that have occurred in the past 400 years, such as the pilgrims going to Massachusetts, uh, the Mormons going to Utah, the Jews going to Palestine. They were all done by groups of people who had a transcendent motive, who wanted to have their own place where they could make their own world their way, and were willing to undertake considerable d danger, discomfort, impoverishment to do it. Okay? And, um, you know, Half the pilgrims died in the first year of Massachusetts. Massachusetts is much colder than anyone. Okay? The Mormons choosing the desert to put themselves. They could have gone to California, you know. They could have gone to Oregon. Uh, many more attractive places were there. But they chose that place because they figured the Protestants wouldn't show up there. Okay. The, the, the Jews going to Palestine. I'm going to Palestine. I'm going to America. I mean, hello. Um, and the, 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 the so, um, in all these cases, th this kind of motivation was there, of, of people who had a transcendent idea of what they wanted. They wanted to build what the pilgrims called a city on a hill. That's what they wanted to do. And um, so, I think there's always going to be people that want to build a city on a hill. Okay? And that's, so they're going to build a city on a higher hill. Okay. Okay. Just, All right. I'm sorry, but uh, unfortunately, we can't. Uh, I know we can stay days and uh, with, with Robert, but we we have we have to leave the museum and because they, they are going to, to close pretty soon. Just wanted to, but uh, well, if you're interested, of course you can uh, go to the website of the Master Society. And you can also attend our next conference in Europe, and you can travel to the United States to listen to each other. And uh, well, you can also read my blog and, uh, <laughs> in the town if you speak French. Uh, well, thank you, thank you everybody, and uh, of course thank you again to our sponsor of uh, uh, BCN and uh, Jean-Luc José, uh, SpaceX. The Chapel and uh, Spectra Time and the uh, Museum of Books and the uh, Track Self, our webmaster and photographer, John. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, just one last thought because this struck me this morning is what uh, Mitko said about uh, our database and communication. Well, this just to be to go back to Earth. That is, all, presently, all our database is on Earth. So, uh, just think about the problem, maybe, hopefully, temporarily, we will have uh, by uh, living on Mars uh, with our database on Earth. Well, soon or later, we'll have to, to transfer, to copy our database on Mars and elsewhere. But, Think about it. This is a, a problem, maybe. Uh, just a word, if you have an idea about that. Well, sure. And um, I want to not only spread our uh, electronic data in space, I want to spread our genetic data in space. Because that's our most important data. Okay, thank you, Robert. Thank you.
בחייאת.